For me, this is probably the most spectacular parsha in the whole Torah. Yeah, that's for me. Uh, you may think the Ten Commandments happen here, or maybe the partition of the Red Sea or Mount Sinai. No, nothing in particular has this, this parsha. It's spectacular because if you look at the parchment that we use in the Torah, that includes our portion that is most worn out. With Parashat Pinchas every holiday and on Rosh Chodesh as well. And because it has all the offerings and in every holiday we remember the offerings that were brought. So we use this Parsha many times throughout the year. And I like it very much also because it was my Bar Mitzvah Parsha. <laughs> well, do you think those are good reasons, that good enough reasons to love the Parsha? Come on, Rabbi, get serious, yes? You're correct. There should be a better reason, right? This Parsha contains what, to me, is the weirdest verse of the whole Torah. To prove what I, pr prove what I just said, I will need your help. So there are many Torah readers this morning here in the synagogue. So here's a question for you. And if you are not a Torah reader, you probably know the answer as well. So how do most of the aliot you've ever read start? Well, yes, with the word amen, because you heard the blessing, but the amen is not in the, in the, in the Torah. Okay, you got me there. But after the amen that you say? Bayomer or? Lori, what do you say? Bayomer or? By Daber, yes? By Daber, Hashem, El Moshe, Emor. And God spoke to Moses. 175 times the same verse is repeated. By Daber, Hashem, El Moshe, Emor. Incredibly, in this parasha, we hear the same words in a different order. In Numbers 27, verse 15, we read, By Daber, Moshe, El Hashem, Emor. Five simple words, a slight change between the subject and the direct object. You probably didn't hear those words since you did homework with your kids, right? Subject and direct object and all that, yes? Yeah. So we are used to hear that God speaks to Moses. Here it's all the way around. By the word, Moshe el Hashem le'emor. So let's see what prompts Moses to suddenly, like never before in the Torah, start a conversation with God. The occurrence that precede this unusual verse are puzzling, are puzzling as well. God instructs Moses to go up to Mount Nebo, probably in Jordan of nowadays, and see the land of Israel after seeing the land of Israel, Moses is going to die on top of Mount Nebo. This is a precise moment when Moses decides to speak to God. This is, the moment, this is the moment when Moses tells God, no, wait a second, I am not done yet. I have a request for, from you, and it's not for me what I'm about to ask. God, I need you to appoint someone who will lead these people so they will, be, will not be left alone like a sheep without a shepherd. The concern for the people of Israel was his only and unique motivation. So let me stop for a moment and ask two questions. Who are the people you care for? And what is going to be your legacy? So leave these questions in the back of your mind and let me go over a little bit more with you the story of the Parsha, because it's still puzzling why Moses asked God for a leader for his people. The Parsha begins telling us the story of Pinchas, the reward that Pinchas received of an act of zealotry in which he killed two public sinners and ended this devastating plague against the people of Israel. Then the Parsha continues with a detailed census of the Israelite camp, detailed, and then it relates a very legalistic narrative of the daughter of, Slo of Slovchad, but not Slovchad, who sought to receive the inheritance of their father when the normal rules of inheritance did not apply. After all these three stories in, is when God asked Moses to go up Mount Nebo and die there. 
and Moses decides to speak up. So what is the common thread of all these three stories? The educator David Block explains as follows. After being cast act of zealotry, God gives him a reward. In any Loten law at British Shalom, I'm giving Pinchas my covenant of peace. And it shall be for him and for all his generations, all the generations that come after him, an everlasting covenant of priesthood. Pinchas' reward wasn't just for him, it was for all his future generations. All the priesthood would forever come from Pinchas. And I am a Kohen, so if I trace back down, I am a descendant of Pinchas. He secured his legacy for all time. So that's the first story. The second story happens after Pinchas' reward. God commands Moses to take a census of the people. But this census is very different than the only other major census in the Torah back at the beginning of Numbers. In the earlier census, the text only gives us the numbers of the population of each tribe. Here are Parsha. The text lists all the names of the people. The descending, the descending of all tribes. And this, is a tri and this tribe had that, this many children, and these were their names, and each of them had this many children, and these were their names, and so on. Why does our census include all of those details, all of the names of the different descendants? Because we are at the end of the 40-year journey in the desert, and the people are about to enter the land. The census is listing the names of each descendant of each tribe who will eventually get their own portion of land in the land of Israel. For these people, the people in the census, divide the land as an inheritance, says the text. These are the people who will settle the land as representatives of their tribes, as representatives of their family. Essentially, this is a census for the legacy of each tribe, of those who will carry on the names of their parents. And in fact, in the third story, the story of the Bnot Slovchad, the daughter of Slovchad, make it very clear that the census was really about legacy. Immediately following of the census, the daughter of Slovchad appro approached to Moses, uh, to Moses with the following claim. Avinu bet bamidbar ubanim lo ayulo. Our father died in the desert, but he had no sons. No sons to inherit their father's eventual portion of the land of Israel. But listen to the words of the daughters of Slovchad. They use the following. They didn't just say, please let us inherit, it, inherit our father's property. Lama igara shem abinu mitoch mishpachto ki ein lo ben. Why should the name of our father be erased just because he had no sons? Give us the portion of land as our brothers would have had. What they were asking for actually was land, but it wasn't just about wealth. It was about something much bigger. It was about legacy. Why should the name of our father be wiped out? And God grants their request. So all three stories are about legacy. What about Moses' legacy? Moses doesn't ask for his own legacy. He simply asks for the people. They need a leader. He's about to die. Moses understands his mission as a leader. And in some ways, we are all leaders in different capacities. Leaders in our families, in our communities, in our country, in our cities. Who are the people you care for? What is going to be your legacy? Two simple questions. So today, each of us need to ascend to our own Mount Nebo, and we all have to look to our future. We have to speak up, as Moses did, and answer these questions. Who are the people we care for? What is going to be our legacy? May we all find the right answers. Shabbat Shalom.